Hello and happy Friday, everybody. Here's what's coming up tonight on Now. Robert Burton was sentenced for his murder conviction. We'll get you all the details on that. We'll also let you know why the distance between you and the closest gym to you could greatly impact your waistline. And we are going to introduce you to the oldest woman in Maine. You're going to want to meet her. And this is New Center Now. The man who led Maine police on one of the longest manhunts in Maine history has been sentenced to 55 years in prison. Hey everyone, I'm Christina Rex. And I'm Lee Goldberg. Robert Burton of Abbott was on the run for 68 days after police suspected him of killing his ex-girlfriend, Stephanie Jin Gibo, back in 2015. New Center's Tennyson Coleman has been following this trial, has all the details for us of the sentencing today. Hey Tennyson. Hey, how's it going, Lee and Christina? Good evening to everyone. This is pretty much the end of a two-year saga that left not just the family of the victim on edge, but the community on edge as well. While Burton was on the run, there were folks who spotted him in the woods of Piscataquis County, causing widespread fear in the region. Today, those people don't have to worry about Burton being in their backyard for a long, long time. This was a tragedy for Robert Burton could spend the rest of his life in prison. These are the last words Burton said publicly before being sentenced to 55 years behind bars for killing Stephanie Ginjibo in 2015. Jibo's father, Vance Gen, said he will never forgive Burton. You can try to do all the good in the world. But if you're a murderer, you're a murderer. A sentiment echoed by Jibo's daughter. And I hope that the guilt of him murdering an innocent young mother stays with him for the rest of his life. They wanted Burton to receive a life sentence. Of course, we, we would have much rather heard the word life, but by the way that it was explained to us, uh, this is kind of a preventive medicine because a life sentence is a lot easier to get overturned than a year term sentence. The defense hoped for a much shorter one. We're happy that the judge um, didn't see it fit to give him a life sentence, but we were um, hoping then thought the judge should give him a, a sentence um, of 20 years or less from what he did. The judge expressed empathy for Jibo's family and friends, saying he would feel exactly how they feel if he were in their shoes before siding with precedent giving Burton nearly six decades in prison. Knowing that the earliest release would be 86 years old, uh, that's pretty much life. The judge asked friends and family of the deceased to try and move forward and to not let this horrible event dictate the rest of their lives. I asked Jibo's father, Vance, what he thought of that advice, and he said he plans to move forward by helping other victims. Guys. Thanks, Tennyson. All right, maybe the ice on my car and yours will finally melt. It looks like it might warm up this week. Yeah, all the way from the low 20s to the mid 20s. Yay, wow. Keith. I'm right here, guys. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, we're going to slowly melt things, and it's been a process because we really, since that freezing rain, haven't dipped or gone above freezing anywhere. So we're still in the 20s right now, teens in the mountains. Another chilly night tonight, not quite as frigid as last night, but cold. Here are the forecast lows, 15 or so in Portland, 17 in Rockland, in the single digits in the mountains. It was 15 degrees below zero, though, this morning in Berlin, so five, relatively a large improvement. Satellite picture showing some clouds increasing here. Watch the system to our south. It's a little bit of a clipper that has digged down into the mid-Atlantic, and most of it will sail to our south, but I just want you to be aware there will be some snow showers and some snow squalls tonight, particularly over the mid coast and down east. Watch it later this evening. Look what's happening in Bar Harbor and uh, Rockland and into Eastport and Jonesboro. This is around two or three in the morning. And some of our small scale computer models are spitting up about three quarters of an inch or so of snow. So if you wake up to a little coating along the coastline, guys, don't be shocked. After that, a couple of storms to talk about for next week. I'll be back in a few minutes for that, guys. Oh, look forward to those 20s yes. forecasts. All right, it takes a pretty special person to make it to 100 
an extraordinary person to make it past that. Doris Farrar is originally from Bar Harbor, but now lives at a home in Freeport. She is, get this, 111 years old so and good. full of life. Doris didn't skip a beat today when she got a special visit from Maine Senator Angus King. Nice to see you. <laughs> Nothing but charm and spunk from Maine's oldest resident. There's an awful lot of excitement going on all the time, one way or another. Born in Maine, uh, great, great grandchildren. Amazing. Joshua Chamberlain died in 1914, and she was born in 1906. It's just kind of amazing, and she's alert and funny, and uh, I just said, I want to I, I want to meet Maine's oldest resident. Doris Farrar is turning 112 in June. And my eyes are starting to not be as good as Aww. they had been. While her vision may not be as good as it once was, she's making sure she captures every sight she sees. Well, she's getting a picture of you all. <laughs> A century of life hasn't dimmed Doris's wit. Very nice. When she was presented with an early Christmas present from Senator King. It's an American flag that flew over the U.S. Capitol. The it's first thing she noticed, they spelled her name wrong. Oh, no kidding. Two R's and, yeah. Two R's and Doris. That sass, Doris says, is her key to a long life. Take part in it and holler and whistle. And I think attitude. I think what you learn from Doris is attitude, it's just being positive. I uh, have to put up with whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I'll just have to take it on the chin. You're it, a good sport, though. <laughs> well, I try to be. <laughs> the nurses and doctors told me Doris barely slept last night and that she spent her whole morning primping to be ready for the senator. Also, uh, her shirt was a little tough to read, but I have to tell you what it said. It said, it's good to be queen. Oh, uh, and there's no doubt she's the queen. My she's grandfather queen. used to call my grandmother the queen. <laughs> so whatever you do, respect the queen. So it's good that Doris has that as well. 1906, oh, that's crazy. <laughs> so while Senator King was celebrating Doris's birthday, new senator did have a chance to ask him about the recent net neutrality decision. Yesterday, the Federal Communications Commission voted to roll back regulations that kept internet service providers from charging consumers different rates depending on their internet habits. Right now, your internet speed is the same no matter what if you're streaming or posting to social media or just reading articles online. But with yesterday's vote, ISP, ISPs will have the ability to slow down or speed up the data pretty much for whatever reason they want. Those in support of the rollback say it's about getting government out of the tech industry, but Senator King says the FCC process may have been corrupted. So I think there may be a court challenge, but also the real way to solve this is in the Congress, that, that we should make some rules, clarify the situation, and we can uh, fix this. Whether we will, I had some conversations just yesterday with uh, several of the leaders on this, and I think there are many people that want to take care of it. The FCC banned states from instituting net neutrality at the local level, so a change would have to come from an act of Congress. The California wildfires have taken two lives and destroyed so many homes, but the video of a rabbit rescue is lifting everyone's spirits in spite of the mass destruction. We will talk to the rabbit rescuer after the break. And today we mourn the death of Instant Messenger, how the internet is paying its respects later on now. Coming up tonight on 207, there are few people who are as enthusiastic about their hobby as bird watchers. We're going to hang out with them on a cold winter morning and the bus driver who is stuffing her bus for charity on 207. My first thought was like, I don't know if she's going to try and like run into the wall of flames that's on the other side of the fence. On the other side of the country, a young man with ties to Maine bravely saved a rabbit from a race raging California wildfires. That video went viral and people all over the nation watched as Caleb Wadman desperately tried to coax that little bunny out of danger. Caleb's mother, Shari, is originally from Maine. Caleb says he knew there were significant risks, but he couldn't let that animal die. And I was like, yeah, you're a small critter. 
This is a huge fire. There's no chance you're going to get out of this. That's when my being to being instinct um, kind of kicked in. There was a part where the fire was coming towards the, the freeway, like on the ground. It was burning a little bit. Bunny was running into that. And I was like, what, where, where are you going? What are you doing? What are you doing? Now, the rabbit is now in the care of the California Wildlife Center. The center posted to its Twitter account a few days ago saying the rabbit rescued is showing improvement but is not out of the woods yet. I don't think there's a pun intended there. We're currently awaiting a call back from the center, though, to ask about the status of the bunny. Caleb was able to visit the bunny during her recovery. This video comes to us from Inside Edition, which you can see every night at 7.30 right here on News Center. And even though we're still two months away from the Winter Games of 2018, preparations are already underway for the 2022, oh, that's gonna be a mouthful, games <laughs> in Beijing, China. Beijing unveiled official emblems for the Winter Olympics and Paralympic Winter Games today. The upper half of the logo was originated from the shape of speed skaters, while the lower part was from a skier. Have you gotten the flu shot this year? I did. Maybe you were put off because you heard the shots are only 10% effective, but is that true? We verify after the break. And if it's going to be this cold, it just might as well snow, right? Well, Keith's tracking some incoming weather. His full forecast coming up. Every year, people all across America line up at the pharmacy or their doctor's office to get the flu shot. Or the supermarket or fast food restaurants or seemingly everywhere where they're <laughs> offering flu shots. But maybe you've been putting it off or you don't want to get one because you're not sure if it even works. How effective is this year's flu shot? This will be fascinating. The Verify team went to find out. They had a very bad flu season, about five times as many cases in the previous year. And a lot of News reports that the flu vaccine is only 10% effective may have you thinking, why even bother to go get the shot? But because the flu can be deadly to all ages and the vaccine life-saving, we decided to verify its effectiveness. So we turned to LSU Health infectious disease expert, Dr. Fred Lopez. They've noticed that the vaccine efficacy in Australia is quite low. Um, on any given year, it's usually 40 to 60 percent effective um, in the United States. This year in Australia, it looks like it's around 10 percent. But those are just preliminary numbers in Australia. So does that mean it'll be the same for the flu in the U.S.? We don't know what's going to happen here. I mean, it's possible that we may see something very similar. We know in given years when H3N2 strains predominate that we're going to have probably a more severe season. And that's the strain we are seeing in the U.S. now, meaning we could have a more severe flu season. But remember, the vaccine gives you protection against three or four flu strains, making it more effective. Even if it's not a perfect match with what's circulating in a community in a given year, it will still provide you with some protection against the complications and severity of the illness that you might develop. So to verify, it's still unknown how effective the vaccine will be in the U.S., but it will help. So doctors urge everyone older than six months to get it because it takes two weeks to build up immunity. Right now, we still need to encourage everyone who has not received a flu vaccine to, to get it and uh, to get it as soon as possible. So at this point, we don't know. Okay. Okay. AOL Instant Messenger, we do know, is officially dead. RIP. In October, we told you AIM announced that December 15th would be the last day for the revolutionary software. Now it's probably been ages since most of us logged onto our profiles. Shout out XO Christina. <laughs> but that didn't keep the nostalgia from rolling in today. People would share their stories with the hashtag AIM memories. Michael says he met his wife on AIM. Aww. They've been married for 14 years and have two children together. Justin says updating your AIM profile with song lyrics was the OG subtweeting. So Do you even true. know what OG means? That's so true. <laughs> oh, I'm feeling so young I right now. I used to really enjoy them after, like, if someone would Original break. gangster, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> someone said in your ear. Um, <laughs> if you if someone broke up with someone else, girl's yeah. favorite thing to do on in, on uh, AIM would be like, I'm out having fun with my friends. Like yeah, that was just me and my girl. That's like that yeah. was like the whole point of Away AIM message. is to. Oh. But it kind of sounds from that first shade. message like AIM might have been the original Tinder. I Humble. guess so. I didn't know you could meet people. Match. I, only, I already knew the people I was talking to. 
same. I'm right? so sad I missed this. Okay, anyway, you didn't have any numbers after I had been able to waste You didn't have any numbers? No, just Christina. You must have had others, huh? No, lots of A's. Okay. Oh, oh, I see lots of A's. Okay. Yeah. All right, anyways. <laughs> Hey, it was cold this morning. Look at Berlin, officially 16 below this morning, three below in Freiburg, six in Portland. So it will be cold tonight, but not that cold. Current temperatures in the 20s and teens will drop down into the single digits in a lot of spots. Want to point out this clipper down here across parts of the mid-Atlantic that's going to sail just to our south out over the Gulf of Maine. It will miss us, but there'll be just enough moisture along the coastline to bring us some light snow showers tonight. So here we are around 11 o'clock. Notice how close this is to down east and the mid coast, and it gets in here around 2, 3 in the morning, and this could add up to 3 quarters to up to an inch of light fluffy snow over down east Maine. So just don't be shocked if you wake up to a coating or more of snow tomorrow morning. It's obviously not a huge deal, but I don't want you to be surprised. That moves out on Saturday morning, and we're clear through the rest of Saturday and through most of the day on Sunday. So the weekend is relatively nice. It is, though, cold during the overnight hours uh, on both evenings. So here's how we're looking for next week. It's an interesting pattern, subtropical jet, polar jet. When these two jets combine is when we have our big storms. They will not combine next week. We'll be dealing exclusively with the polar jet, which means that we stay cool, but we also have frequent and less strong storms. So the storms won't be as big, but we'll see one once every couple of days. So that's uh, is a kind of a different pattern than the one that we've been in. Here's how it plays out. Monday, some light snow comes through. Again, we're on the cold side of things there. Could see an inch or two. Then another system comes through on Tuesday, a mixture of rain and snow showers. We get a break on Wednesday, Thursday before another storm comes in on Friday. It's pretty early for snowfall numbers on Monday, but that hasn't stopped me before. One or two inches should do it for most of us. The mountains could see just a little bit more. So light snow Monday, Tuesday mixture of rain and snow showers, Wednesday and Thursday looks okay. Our next storm after that comes on Friday. That could be a mixture of rain and snow. Kind of the same deal along the coastline here where the temperatures are just a little bit different and there is a mix later in the day on Friday. Guys, looking beyond that, which is obviously super long range, it does not look all that tranquil for around Christmas. So we'll try to iron that out as we get closer, but it looks like there could be something cooking around there. <sighs> Coal in the stocking for Keith yeah. this year. That's <laughs> definitely going to happen. All right, in just a few months, the UK will have a new member of the royal family. American actress Meghan Markle and Prince Harry have set a date for their highly anticipated <laughs> wedding. And wedding planners will have to get to work fast to get everything ready by May 19th. Lucy Kavanaugh reports from London. Britain's Prince Harry and his fiancée, American actress Meghan Markle, are making it clear that humanitarian and charitable work is a top priority for them. They chose Nottingham, England as the location of their first post-proposal public engagement. On this World AIDS Day, they visited a charity AIDS fair in the central English city. There, the couple spoke to HIV activists and several people living with the disease. And you can clearly see that there's uh, an, an immense amount of love and adoration for each other, um, for, you know, from a personal point of view, of course, uh, but also for the work. Harry's late mother, Princess Diana, was instrumental during her life for breaking down the stigma attached to the disease. Harry and now Meghan plan to continue following closely in her footsteps. The royal couple also met students at Nottingham Academy and watched a rap performance as part of an anti-violence program. You can see why they're, they're, they're a couple, you know, very, very down to earth, uh, very, very, very hands-on. Very... This was Prince Harry's third trip to Nottingham since establishing the youth and AIDS charities there in 2016. A fitting first stop for a royal couple kicking off what will be months of travel. As Markle learns more about the country, she will soon call home. Laura Aguirre, NBC News. So when you're looking for a home, people always say location, location, location. But did you know that the location of your home could have a direct effect on your health and weight? Keith Carson will look into that coming up during our Brain Drops segment. But 
before we get to that. Right after Braindrops. I mean, right after that. <laughs> Cindy Williams this. will be coming up for News Center at 5.30. What's coming up Thank next? you for killing time for me there. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, the Maine Treasury has a lot of lost or forgotten valuables, and the staff is just waiting for the owners of that property to come claim it. Everything from coin collections to jewelry. Clay Gordon will take us inside their vault. And are your Christmas lights slowing down your internet? You know, I've been hearing this a lot lately. We have the answer for you, the true answer, coming up on News Center at 530. Interesting. All right. Yeah, Had you heard that one before? No, I'm but all right. I'm watching that. Don't give it away. <laughs> now I'll be back away. right after this. <laughs> All right, today is uh, interesting. We're always talking about evaluating studies, and this was a good study. It was done in the UK. Okay, a lot of, lot of words here, but basically your distance, the distance from your house to either a gym or a playing field and how much fatty tissue is on you. So they used a big sample size and they used three measures of body fat, waist circumference, body mass index, and body fat percentage. Now, not all of those are created equal, and the reason I point this out is body mass index has its limitations. It takes into account your height and your weight, and that's it. So let's go to the next frame here. And what I'm going to show you, uh, hold on, can we go back to the other image? We can't we go can't. back. I was going to show you that my body, my body mass index is technically close to obese. So you have to be careful with that. The calipers and the percentage oh of fat is what's the that, better way to do it. Make me? That is bold to put, be willing to <laughs> yeah. put your BMI on Well, TV. I don't think anybody's too concerned. Cheers. Anyways, okay. so if you're within <laughs> one kilometer, which is a little over a half mile, from either a swimming pool, playing field, or a gym, they did not include um, a park in this because they said you could just go hang out in a the park. They found that you had a smaller waist, you had less fatty tissue in general. They did a relationship also with fast food. What if you lived with less of these in your radius? And they found a slight correlation there, but the activity correlation was higher. And they did a good job, big sample size. They accounted for social status, how much money you make, education, age, and whether or not you had a disability. So they did all the important things. What if you live close to these places, but you still don't work out? You have no excuse. You don't show up. Yeah, they, yeah, they account for that without <laughs> meaning to, but it. Convenience is key, I think, is the bottom line. All right. Got it. New Center yep. 530 starts. Right now.